Uh, good evening, everybody, to this event, reading and discussion with two great authors, Matthew Aikens, on my very left, on your very right, and Taqi Ahlaki, on my left, and here in the middle. Um, the connection between the two uh, seems maybe obvious if you have just a look at them. It's Afghanistan. But maybe that's also a fake. We're going to talk about that. Uh, one of them is Afghan, and you might choose who is it. I don't know if you will find it out. I don't think so. Anyhow, um, I think the name makes it so. The joke is lost. <laughs> Matthew Aikens uh, is, uh, yeah, is a world format, one of the best journalists we have these days, writing for the New York Times. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a subscription and are interested in Afghanistan, uh, you will read his uh, contributions regularly, regularly and you will be impressed. Um, he, is, um, he got a Pulitzer Prize um, for one of his um, works for the New York Times, reporting from Afghanistan and the Middle East since uh, quite a time now, like 14 years. He started in 2008, um, I read, in his homepage, which I can recommend, by the way. It's a beautiful homepage. Um, it's called, uh, if I remember well, it's www.mikins, isn't it? Like Makins. Yeah, have a look. It's a great website, and you find a lot of information about him. Um, he also contributed to the New York Times Magazine, uh, Rolling Stone, and several other media. Um, he is here now because uh, he has written his first book. It's quite a comprehensive book. It's quite a large book. Um, I think most of you have heard about it and has been translated into German and it's called in German Die Nackten Fürchten Kein Wasser. The naked don't feel the water, isn't it? That's, yeah, that's, how yeah, it that's, that's it. it. That's yeah. How, how did you find the title? It's a funny. You you could say, well, what does it mean? Why this title? The ti the title is a Dari proverb, "Luch as ob namiter sad," which means the naked don't fear the water. Something like if you have nothing to lose, you have nothing to fear. And it is a story about people. I, I wouldn't say they have nothing to lose, but they have um, they have definitely many reasons to leave. And um, the book is about a writer, a journalist, like Matthew, who is in Afghanistan and uh, who sees everybody leaving and who, is, who wants to cover these events. And, um, and then he has a friend who also wants to leave and, and they decide to leave together. Um, the one, although being Canadian, by citizenship, isn't it? Um, deciding to, well, to play as if he was an Afghan and going with the other. And uh, this is the story we read in this book. So you have a, he's an eyewitness of uh, one of the great, um, or the, the big dramas, the big tragedies of our times, which is um, the influx of so many, not the influx, but which is the, the fact that so many people are forced to leave and try to find another life. Um, this is what happened to, uh, to Taqi, uh, who uh, was born in, I think you were born in Iran. You were not even born in Afghanistan, isn't it? Uh, no, I, I was born in Afghanistan. Ah, and then okay, when I was a, a small kid, uh, probably two years old, uh, we went from Afghanistan to Iran. Okay. And then I... Uh, I went to a school in uh, Iran and um, graduated from a school there. And in 2004, I went back to Afghanistan and then uh, lived in Kabul in the last uh, 18 years. And then after the collapse of Kabul in, into the hands of Taliban last year, um, together with my family, I came here. So around one year, I live here in Berlin. <laughs> um, you wrote uh, about uh, this experience of being uh, 
for um, an Afghan born in Afghanistan, yes, but grown up in Iran. And for quite a while, it was more, you felt more at home in Iran or when you had the idea of home, uh, for you was more Iran than it was Afghanistan. This is what I read in, um, in this collection of essays uh, where I find one contribution by Taki. Uh, it has been edited by Charlotte Raut and Ulrich Scheiber, so the guys who organized this festival. This festival. And you, you write, for, for you now, you, you don't know what it is home. It was complicated, you know, uh, because um, I grew up in Iran, but from the very beginning, I knew that I don't belong, belong in Iran. Uh, the people, you know, the, my, uh, my playmates, uh, my classmates at the school, they used to tell me that you're an Afghan. But I had no idea from Afghanistan. And um, even though I grew up in, in Iran, I had always this, um, this connection from Iran. I, I had the feeling that I don't belong here. And I had the, uh, the, a strong feeling that I have to return to a place called Afghanistan some uh, sometime in future. But then I returned to Afghanistan, um, and then Afghanistan was not the place I knew. And um, I, I had a hard time to cope with the new place. Everything was new, um, and um, I lost my routine, I lost my uh, friends, I lost my... Um, um, my t teachers, masters, you know, uh, I had a life in Iran, but then I had nothing in Afghanistan, I had to start from zero. And then uh, last year, for the third time in my life, I had to start over. And I was 35 years old, now 60, uh, 36 years. And then thinking to myself that now you are starting over for the third time. And then, um, Mm. Is there any guarantee that you are not going to be in the same position 10 years from now on? <laughs> so I have a very um, strong uh, feeling of insecurity that probably I, I have to leave my place again. And you know, there is something in my head saying, don't invest too much also here in Germany, probably you are going to leave. But yeah, this is a bit complicated to say that where I belong and um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe you. Uh, we are already in the middle of the discussion, I see. Um, it's also that uh, Taki, of course, has many languages. He Now he speaks quite well German. We are speaking English here, and he writes in Dari, and he has written uh, uh, this book. Uh, it has been translated into German. It's called Aus Heiterem Himmel. It's a bilingual edition, so uh, if, you, if you are lucky enough to read Farsi, uh, you, will enjoy, you will enjoy it um, twice. Um, and uh, I know Taki for quite a while because he wrote for a journal of mine. Uh, I edited once for the Goethe Institute. And he wrote wonderful essays. He's a very good, it's not only a good short story writer and a good writer, but he also wrote wonderful essays. And he's going to read a passage of one of these essays for us. But um, I would love to start with... Uh, uh, Matthew, and uh, one of the most, um, well, let me ask you, what was the most, uh, in your journey with your friend Omar, um, from Afghanistan to Europe, what was the most um, dangerous uh, situation, what was the most intriguing passage? Well, there were many dangerous situations that we faced, uh, because people have to risk their lives as smugglers to cross borders that they're not allowed to cross because they're not get given visas. You know, Afghans are, um, and other refugees are deliberately kept out of the West by a system of visa regulations. Afghans have the worst passport in the world when it comes to visa-free travel, which is deliberate because no one wants asylum seekers, people they can't deport. So Afghans are forced to risk their lives as smugglers. It's a very dangerous route, which is the route that we took. I would say the part that I felt personally most frightened was when it was actually shortly before the passage I'm going to read where we were in Turkey in the safe house waiting to be taken to the beach uh, so a van came and, and brought us and we were driving at night toward the Turkish coast and at one point the smugglers got scared so they stopped and kind of left the van the van was packed full of people and my friend and I Omar we were crammed into the back 
so we couldn't really move. We were, we were stuck in a small space, and it soon got hot and difficult to breathe. And I'm a bit claustrophobic, so at this moment I began to think of this terrible incident that had happened the previous summer when I think more than 40 people had suffocated to death in a meat truck in Austria, as you probably remember. And so, and I remember when I read about that, I had already been thinking about making this journey, and I had promised myself that I would never allow myself to get into that situation. That's not how I wanted to go. Of course, you don't really have any control over your fate um, in these situations. And, and anyhow, it, a kind of bad hour passed, and then the smuggler came back, and we were, everything was fine. We continued onward and arrived on the beach around midnight. <laughs> um. Okay, uh, we are curious to, to listen to you, to have a passage f for us about uh, this passage between uh, uh, Turkey and uh, Lesbos, is it? Yeah, we, we were traveling from somewhere near the city of Çanakkale on the coast of Turkey, and we were taking a boat for the island of Lesbos in Greece. Uh, if I can just find it here. Omar and I went down to the beach, where we'd have a better chance of making a run for it if the police came. The smugglers had forbidden smoking, but we lit a cigarette anyway and shared it, shielding its ember in our cup palms as we stared at the black surface of the inlet. Are you ready? I am, brother. Wheeze, wheeze, wheeze. The smugglers were inflating the dinghy with a foot pump. Now and then a car would come crunching down the gravel road, and everyone would hush up and crouch, the headlights silhouetting their forms for a moment. How many had come here before? I was sure we were neither the first nor the last. Like us, they had left behind what they could not carry. On this beach, they had prayed in different tongues for the same thing, to pass across the water. Now a group of refugees came down the slope, bearing the boat's green and white pontoons on their shoulders. The rest of us gathered as they launched the dinghy and watched the smuggler fit on the outboard engine. They waded the boat out waist deep and gave the helmsman some final instruction. He was just a refugee. They'd selected most likely in exchange for a free ride since the inflatables made one-way journeys. When the smuggler signaled to us, we grabbed our bags and rushed forward. The cool water on my calves set a jolt up my spine. When I reached the boat, I hauled myself up over the squeaky rubber and found a seat on the port side. Omar got in next to me. One by one, the smuggler said in Arabic. After the men had lined up on the pontoons facing inward, we put the women and children on the floor in the center. There are almost 50 of us packed into 25 feet of rubberized canvas. The starter cord snapped and the engine roared to life. The smugglers gave us a shove and the helmsman clicked the outboard into gear, a long V rippling out behind us. On an island at the mouth of the inlet, there were stone buildings and wood cabins, lit in mauve and green, a luxury resort. It was near midnight, and a guest out late would have seen us just offshore, huddled and riding into darkness. As we rounded the point, a shimmering band came into view on the horizon. Lesvos, about 10 miles away. The sea loomed around us as the land shrank away. The boat began to rock in the swells, which had the choppy motion that comes after a storm. Apart from the floorboards, the dinghy lacked any structural support and undulated with each wave, pitching us against one another. Our vessel was laughably unseaworthy an overgrown pool toy, ready to pop. We had to reach Greek waters before the Turks caught us, but the helmsman, a young Syrian with a fuzzy lantern jaw, kept the throttle at idle, despite the urgings of the passengers to hurry. Perhaps the smugglers had warned him not to overstrain the dinghy. He stood in an unsteady crouch, swinging the tiller back and forth, and each time we dipped into a swell, 
he called out an invocation to God, like a whistle buoy. Ya Rab! Ya Rab! His friends beside him were making a racket too, speechifying in Arabic about having faith and leaving Turkey and more that I couldn't follow. A curly-haired little Iraqi girl was sitting with her parents on the floor in front of me. As the swells grew rougher, her head kept knocking against my knee. So I reached out and cradled her head. Her mother didn't seem to notice. She looked like she was about to be sick. It was too dark to see the other passengers' faces clearly, but as I listened to their whimpers and groans, I became aware of the utter terror that surrounded me. I could feel Omar tensing beside me with each wave. It was the first time that he'd ever been to sea. The same must have been true for many of my boatmates. We are most frightened of the unknown. It was different for me. I'd grown up on the ocean. I felt another kind of dread. I imagined the water rushing inward with its sudden chill and rehearsed what I'd have to do. I was a strong swimmer and I could save myself. I would help Omar, but I knew that without a life jacket, I'd have to get away from the others fast if we didn't want to get taken down in the panic thrashing. We'd swim clear and wait. The drowning are silent. You need air to scream. Afterward, for those on the surface, it would be a matter of time. I'd heard that the jackets were often fake and would absorb water. Even if we stayed afloat, we'd eventually die of exposure, although the sea was warm enough this time of year to survive through the night. It was five miles to the shore from midpoint, and there were currents, a long swim. Better to stick together and wait for rescue, if it came. The girl's skull was warm on my palm, and I realized that she'd fallen asleep. The moon had yet to rise, and stars danced in the facet of the waves. Red and green lights blinked up and down the coast. We were crossing Europe's moat. The Mediterranean is the world's deadliest border. Since the year 2000, more than 30,000 migrants were recorded as having died there, alongside an unknown number. Nature sanitizes the killing floor, as Jason de Leon wrote about the Sonoran Desert and its vultures between the United States and Mexico. The loss of a body means someone cannot be properly grieved. Thus the horror of drowning in so many cultures and the ghosts who wait by shore. Thank you. Of course, that we, we just got a very, very short impression of a, of a wonderful book which reads like a, a novel, uh, very well written, but it is uh, most of the time it is reality is some kind of documentation. Uh, I can only recommend it. Um, Taki, uh, you have read the book, of course. Um, you have listened to this, um, to met your reading. Uh, what do you think, I mean, what, what is your, what do you think when you, when you hear that? I mean, you have come to Germany, you were quite lucky because you got a writer's grant from the German Academic Exchange Service. You're here for a year, safe. Afterwards, you don't know, of course. But for the time being, that's quite OK. You have come with your family, I mean, with your wife and your sons. Um, so you read this passage about people trying to cross the Mediterranean. What, what does it make, what does it do to you? Uh, when I read Matthew's book, um, you know, I could relate a lot because um, I have seen and experienced a lot of these uh, uh, sins. Uh, not, you know, coming to uh, Turkey, Iran, you know, uh, you know, illegally, but the stories that uh, happen to friends or friends' friends or relatives. And um, I was impressed by the how accurate the information of Matthew <laughs> was, you know, because. Uh, for example, he says about Umar, and Umar was also uh, going uh, to school in Iran, and then uh, in Iran he learned how to uh, fire Kalashnikov in case the United States you know, attacks uh, Iran 
they already know how to fire, uh, you know, how to use a Kalashnikov. And this is exactly what I did in Iran. <laughs> you know, I uh, learned how to uh, use a Kalashnikov and then how to uh, put it into parts and then put it together again. There are a lot of analogies between the protagonist of, or between exactly, Omar, the yeah, protagonist of Matthew, and yourself. Omar. He him, he also was grew up in Iran. Yeah, yeah probably yeah. I am Omar. And I what don't know. what uh, what city were you in in Iran? In in Qom. In Qom. Okay, yeah, okay. a very religious yeah. city. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I was a very religious person too um, for a long time, and um, but then it has it's another story. But how I sh transformed from a very religious person to a person. Um, who is a um, non-believer and who says um, uh, his prophet is uh, Nietzsche <laughs> and his <laughs> book is also Shbach Zagatusta. And this is exactly why I started learning German because you should be able to uh, read your uh, holy book in, in original, right? <laughs> So um, yeah, and then um, well, that's why I wanted to. That's why I quote so much Rumi in the in the book because I wanted exactly, to read yeah, Rumi in the original Persian. Yeah, uh, the, the the details, you know, and the uh, um, information. It was completely true. Yeah, like you know, Umar. In one part of the book, it says that you know, in two thousand and four, people in Iran were not allowed to go to universities anymore. This exactly happened to me. I wanted to go to university in Iran, but then I could not, and I had to return to Afghanistan. So a, a big part of uh, my return to, Afghan to Afghanistan was because I was not able to go to university in 2004. And um, the other part that was fun to read uh, from Matthew's books was that the, the quotes, uh, the Dari quotes, uh, you know, because you, you see a lot of quotes in, in Dari, which are only in Dari. There, there is no translation of uh, of these quotes, and so, the, so little parts of original Afghan language exactly you, you, know, you find in the book in the original well yeah in, like in the original it's pronounced yeah, yeah yeah, and most of them are if words <laughs> the, the dirty parts yeah <laughs> yeah exactly. they translate those yeah and I don't remember ha uh, reading so much there if words in one book, but I have read them in Matthew's books. <laughs> 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 it's a new frontier a lot of them. In, yeah, in Dari literature. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he was saying that he is thinking about translating this book in, into Dari, and I really don't know how to do that. You know, in Dari <laughs> <laughs> the important thing is you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was fun to read. Uh, that's, that's super it's great to know, to know this from uh, somebody who knows what it's about. Um, so, uh, yeah, we would like to listen to you. Read us something. Talking. Okay. I would read um, from um, an essay of mine, which is uh, published in a book called um, The Other Kabul, Remains of, uh, Remains of the Garden. Mm -hmm. So it's an ontology. Um, and uh, with... Um, you would see um, um, some texts by other writers, but also uh, um, paintings and arts of uh, 20 um, artists, and all, it's a, all it's Afghans. A, so. it's, about, it's a book about Afghanistan, or about Kabul, or the, about the gardens yes. in Kabul? Or? Exactly. It's a book about... Uh, the, the idea is... Um, and the garden, the concept of garden, uh, is in the center of this book. Mm -hmm. And then um, yeah, you see pictures of the, the art pieces of the Afghan artist, uh, with, along with um, some texts, uh, one by me, and I think there are four more texts in this book. So Kabul was a green city before, long before? I think the gardens in Kabul once uh, famous. You know, we had uh, Mughal Empire in Afghanistan, and then uh, um, like 500 years ago, uh, Babur Shah, in, uh, he really uh, liked Kabul. Uh, along his way to India, he decided to stay in Kabul for a while, and then he said it's a good place to have some gardens here because the weather is so good here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We and you you have like 200 sunny days in Kabul. Mm -hmm. um, so um, he established a garden called Babur Garden uh, after his name, and then two more gardens 
also which are still today in Kabul. And a lot of history gathered around these gardens. You know, you, you could see the treaties between um, uh, the Afghan kings with the uh, England mm -hmm. also were signed in these gardens. Okay. And then uh, Germans, German, you know, Germans were uh, at some point settled, you know, in these gardens. So okay. yeah, a lot of history. So um, the text is called "Our Gardens Help Us Survive." In the spring um, 2019, a piece of news appears in the media. The construction of Chilsutun Garden is complete, and now its gates are open to families. My wife, our two sons, and I plan to go there on Friday. We usually don't go much uh, out for fun, preferring to stay home as much as we can for two main reasons. Explosions and occasional suicide attacks that can occur on the East streets or in a crowded place at any time. The second reason is that there are not many places to inter uh, for entertainment in Kabul anyway. Those days, the city was um, growing exponentially and its infrastructure was unable to meet the needs of the population. There were no exact figures, but it was estimated that six million people were living there. Therefore, when we went to the parks or the zoo in Kabul, the, we were always faced with a huge crowd that seemed to have gathered for a demonstration. Sometimes there was not even a place to put a needle, as we say in the area. The crowded population also means more danger, and that is why instead of having fun, we spend more time in panic, expect, expecting that something bad is about to happen. On such an occasion, I was particularly afraid that an explosion would occur and a member of the family would be injured or killed. What will happen to the rest if I die? If, if, one of, if one of us dies, what would our life be like? And so the questions would keep popping up in my mind. However, as we say in Afghanistan, we threw our hearts into the sea probably similar to Matthew's title. We threw our hearts into the sea and went to the Chilsutun Garden, where the end of the 19th century, Abdul Rahman Khan, the king of Afghanistan, and Henry uh, Mortimer Durand of England signed the Treaty of Durand, and to a large extent formed the current Afghanistan and later a country known today as Pakistan. What we saw completely surprised us, surprised us. The garden had been rebuilt exactly like the stories we have heard. The same magnificent gate, the same stonework, the same fountains. They even built a pigeon house inside. It was as if we were sitting in a time machine traveling 50 years ago. My sons ran happily on the grass, my wife said. I don't believe that Kabul can have such a beautiful place. It's like we are thrown into the future. It's interesting. We both had the, exactly the same feeling, time travel, but in different directions. <laughs> she to the future and I to the past. However, the result was almost the same. History in Afghanistan is ridiculously and catastrophically like the hands of a clock constantly repeating an endless cycle, a cycle of violence that has trapped it like an eternal curse. People settle down, move forward, and at a very moment when they think they have jumped from the crucial milestone, they are thrown back into their original place and have to start all over again. I remember the legend of Sisyphus, and his absurd suffering, a man who carries a stone to the top of a mountain, only for it to roll down. And each time it did, he carried, carried it back to the top. We know sometimes how vain our sufferings are, but we cannot let them go. Or maybe it is these sufferings that don't let us go. I wish we could at least learn something 
But unfortunately, this is also evidently impossible. Hegel says, we learn from, we learn from history that we learn nothing from the history. So it's better to let go of these heavy thoughts and enjoy nature. Chisutun Garden is so large that anyone can find solitude in a quiet corner. We also spread a carpet under a tree and listen to the sound of water splashing. Hafiz, the Persian poet, whispers in my ear, the rosy cheek of the world's rose garden is all I need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiya. Uh, when was this garden uh, reopened, or at which year precisely, do you know, this uh, scene uh, developed? Uh, 2019, if I'm not mistaken. And okay. it is interesting to know that it was um, rebuilt by um, German money. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. the Germans uh, invested in, in, uh, in rebuilding the garden. Oh, that's good, that's good. You also work for the Germans, you work for the GEZ. The yeah, Gesellschaft exactly. für internationale Zusammenarbeit. Yeah, this is something that uh, I usually keep hidden, but yeah. Okay. I, w <laughs> <laughs> I worked for them for uh, seven years, and um, from 2014 until 2021. Yeah, so I was the employee of the German Development Corporation in Afghanistan. Okay, um, let's keep it a secret. <laughs> this is a secret. Okay. <laughs> Um, um, Matthew, you, uh, last time you, you were in Afghanistan was in, in May of this year, uh, you just told me, so quite recently, uh, and you also witnessed uh, the, um, the takeover of the, of the Taliban last year. You, were, you stayed there in the country until, even when everybody had left, you stayed there, I think, until November. Um, are there still gardens in Kabul right now, like this one? Yes, there's gardens, but not very many women in those gardens. In That's those one gardens. of the changes under the Taliban, is that women have uh, been increasingly excluded from public split bases where they would mix with men. Yeah, and you just published an article in the New York Times about why women again are forbidden to go to uh, school, at least uh, at, a, at a higher level. Um, I can just recommend it to you to read that piece by, by Matthew. I want to ask a more difficult question, which is, um, which is a, I was hesitating if I should ask this, but um, you were really witnessing it, what was going on, and you were also witnessing it in a way, um, because you just lived there. Um, there were so many promises or so many expectations connected with the fall of the Taliban in 2001 and the rebuilding of Afghanistan and everything and all this ended uh, in a catastrophe like Sisyphus we, we tried to, uh, to push the stone up to the peak of the hill and we were just maybe we we're already there and then it came back you know so um, if I may ask this a bit, it's a bit simplistic question, but what went wrong, Matthew? <laughs> what went wrong? I mean, we, was it was it uh, like was it written uh, that it must go wrong, or w what went wrong? C could we have done better in Afghanistan? What went wrong is that we invaded another country, occupied it with our troops, funded warlords who abused human rights and refused to allow <laughs> elements of the Taliban to make peace. And when that war started to grow wrong, we sent more weapons, more troops, billions of dollars that caused corruption that rotted the government out from the inside. We funded a 20-year war, a civil war, that killed more than 176,000 people, almost all of them Afghans. And we lied to ourselves about what we were doing there. Mm -hmm. We used Afghan women as poster children for our intervention when it was really about the war on terror. We pretended that we were supporting democracy when a fraction of the population bothered to vote. Um, and then we, we abandoned it in a way that was incredibly callous. I don't know if by that point the outcome could have been changed, but I would say that's sort of a, a, a rough guess at what went wrong. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, was it, uh, what you say now, is it like you, you say it in hindsight, retro retrospectively, or is it, 
Is it something you you kind of felt or uh, you? What was your impression when you already came there? What, what's your, how, how developed your view? How has your view onto Afghanistan developed while you were there? I went to Afghanistan in 2008 at a moment when the war was already going wrong. You know, it was clear that uh, violence was increasing, the Taliban were getting stronger. It was also the moment that President Obama was elected and um, he and his generals decided to do this surge. And I think a lot of people, people with far more experience than myself at that time, saw that the surge was going to be a tragic mistake. They warned against um, this kind of short-term military strategy that would, would fuel violence. But at the time, writing you know, that opinion made you a very lonely voice. I, I the vast majority of journalists, um, certainly in the United States, were more or less repeating the official line. They went on embeds to tour the country with American generals who told them this fantastic narrative of progress that they were making and how just, you know, they had reached the turning point after all these years and soon the Taliban would be defeated. I mean, people just cozied up to power and accepted the line from Washington, just as they did for the first half of the Vietnam War. And then eventually things became so obvious that now everyone is, you know, is quite certain that the war was, was destined for failure, but I do remember a moment when that was a minority view and we were trying to warn people mm -hmm. about what was happening. We were trying to warn people about the human rights abuses, the atrocities that were being committed by Afghan government forces that were f you know, fueling resentment and support for the Taliban. Uh, but these, you know, I'll give you an example. The, you know, the story that, that was part of the New York Times team that won the Pulitzer this year, was an investigation of an airstrike that happened in Kabul last summer by a drone. Maybe some of you remember it. The United States fired a drone in a car inside a house and announced that they had taken out an ISIS target. And the next morning, my housemate and I, Jim Hoylebrook, photographer, we went to the site in Kabul and we found a, a family in grief with their neighbors and you know, body parts piece spattered around this courtyard of this house where they said seven children had been killed. The target had been a man named Zemarai Ahmadi. He, was a, a work, he worked for an American aid group, they told us. Um, and yet, so we published our initial report and yet only a few days later we had the version from the US military saying that this was guy was ISIS, he had a bomb in his car, it was a righteous strike is what a few days later the top American general said. And, it, and it, you, you felt like you were being gaslit, but it was a familiar experience because for so many years we had tried to report on stories um, of civilian casualties like the destruction of a doctor's at Borders Hospital in 2015, which was deliberate, and these were usually ignored. And it was only at a moment where the world was watching and at a moment where the press corps was in Kabul and we could access the strike that the military was eventually forced to admit they had made a mistake, they had killed an innocent man and his family. Um, and, you know, like you said about, about Hegel and the, the owl of Minerva, now the U.S. military has announced that it will, you know, take this into account and, and they're, they're having a whole commission to study civilian casualties. But it's, of course, the moment that the war on terror has ended or, or certainly reached a phase where you're not having a lot of airstrikes overseas. So it's very in, easy for them to in, accept this criticism. But that was criticism we were raising um, for, for 20 years against the official narrative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Taki, I want to ask the same question to you. Um, do you, you share uh, uh, Matthew, Ma Matthew's opinion? Uh, what, what was your experience and while uh, living there? Yeah, uh, my perspective is a bit different. I mean, I totally agree with what Matthew says, but uh, I see things from a different perspective, from perspective of young generation who wanted to uh, built Afghanistan, you know, eventually, and we failed, and uh, we were defeated by the Taliban, and we, we feel like so humiliated and so um, disappointed. And uh, when I returned to Afghanistan in 2004, millions of other refugees also returned to Afghanistan, and um, Afghanistan is also a very young country, and you could see that this youth had this impression that we are, this time is going to be different and we are going to change it, we are a different generation. But now we, we, it's difficult for us to face that no, uh, we are not really different and we are defeated by the very same Taliban. Um, I've been trying to understand what happened in Afghanistan because the collapse of 
Kabul was kind of a huge shock for for me and for many Afghans too. Um, and I, I've been writing about this, and um, I, the result of this writing has become a novel, uh, which is uh, happening uh, in a um, in an international development organization in Kabul. So it's like a it sounds familiar, it sounds right? Familiar. Mm -hmm. Be because uh, I think uh, at some point we really uh, wanted, I mean the uh, international community together with Afghans really wanted to do something good for Afghanistan. And there were hopes in Afghanistan, but then at some point everything went wrong. And it was not uh, just one mistake or one, you know, um, aspect. I think it, it has different dimensions that, you know, all together they worked and eventually uh, uh, worked like a um, chain of action reactions. So uh, at the end of the day, I mean, 2020 or, you know, 2019, it was clear that anything we do, we make the situation worse. So, um, uh, but still we did not expect, you know, for Kabul to collapse that rapidly. Um, and yeah, it's still a big question for me and uh, I've been writing about this um, and I think the best way I can um, articulate what I think about this is uh, the format of a novel. Mm -hmm. So uh, I use this office the, you know, as a metaphor kind of um, symbol that we really wanted to do something good. We had budget, we had uh, human resources, um, but we could not do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at the um, international development organizations, USAID, GAYSAID, or so many others, they were in Afghanistan, they had, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of uh, dollars in euros. Um, they had um, enough human resources. But if you look at what they did, you know, many of um, their projects don't make any sense at all. And you, you ask yourself how those smart people could do such a stupid thing. And um, I think it, it, they, they really didn't want to do stupid things intentionally, but you know, they uh, had um, conditions on the ground and they had uh, their, their own mindsets that they, um, they thought they are doing something good, but uh, it was not good. But on the other hand, the, what made everything more complicated was the relations between the Afghans and international community. Mm -hmm. you know, because historically, I think uh, what is not understood by international community is that the way we look to the West, you know, from um, Afghanistan has a tradition uh, uh, from like more than 100 years that uh, the kings are somehow appointed or connected to the uh, to an external power. So they don't seek this source of legitimacy inside Afghanistan, but rather outside Afghanistan. The same thing you, you could see with the Taliban. They don't refer to the people, but you know, to, to, to the United States. They are begging for the uh, funds of Afghanistan, which are frozen uh, somewhere in in US. And they are trying to make a connection with US because they think the source of their legitim legitimacy and the source of um, um, being recognized as a state uh, is somewhere outside Afghanistan. Okay, yeah, yeah. And when when I have, when I understand our relationships, you know, I mean, I as Afghan and uh, and a German uh, as a person who can do something really good for me, who can put me in power, um, then the nature of relationship is completely different. And we had this in a, in a small scale, also in the in inside the these international offices, the development organizations. Mm -hmm. You would come up as a German with a stupid project, with the idea <laughs> that we do some, some for example, uh, gymnastic courses for the old woman in uh, some, somewhere in the outer skates. <laughs> and I would say it's a wonderful idea <laughs> because the way our relationship is built is that 
I have to admire you in order to, you know, climb on the stairs of power. There is no benefit for me, you know, to criticize your idea. And then you think, ah, maybe that's a really good idea. You know, I, I had this feedback from Afghans. They told me this is a good idea. And then um, I think the nature of this relationship has never been understood good enough. Mm. So, and I think even today is, is, is still being mistaken. Uh, you, you see that, you know, Ashraf Ghani, the president of Afghanistan, were mostly talking in English in interviews, and after even collapse of Kabul, he makes interviews in English. It's clear that he's talking to the international community, not to the Afghan people, because he, don't, he doesn't care about the Afghans, <laughs> because he was not appointed by the Afghans, you know, the... So uh, I think uh, and a lot of cultural complications were not understood uh, well enough. So, yeah, I, I personally see things from um, this perspective. I'm, I'm very curious to read your novel now. Please finish <laughs> okay. it soon. Yeah, I, I write it in Farsi. Um, so, yeah. We'll find a translator for you. Okay. For sure. <laughs> Um, okay, now we, we have talked a lot about very, yeah, more, more or less depressing events or um, problems, whatever. Uh, when I read your book, uh, uh, Matthew, I also got a lot of positive energy. There's, uh, first of all, the writing is great, but then also there is a certain love for 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 everything you you write about and also this it's not only it's not only the narrator which really has a deep relation to what he's talking about but also uh, there's a lot of poetry there in Afghanistan for example it's it's all it's full of poetry this book it's there's a lot of passion there's a lot of um, yeah there's there's something real and I, when I when I read this book I thought well this guy has enjoyed being there. It was not just it was not just a torture or just a, a profession you were forced to do. You you kind of enjoyed it. So what were what are the positive uh, what, what things you are dreaming about? What things you miss from Afghanistan? What is what is this positive thing there? Yeah, I, I think one of the um, one of the aspects of going undercover like this as an Afghan refugee that I found most interesting was just that you got to speak with people in their everyday mode. And I think there's a tendency as journalists sometimes to depict refugees as these poor suffering people who are, whose lives are just unrelenting misery. And of course, they are victims of a very brutal border regime. But they also have fun and, and, and love affairs and adventure and jokes. And I, I think I got to experience that because pe people were acting you know, normally around me. So there's a lot of that in the book. The heart of the book, of course, is a love story, not my love story, but Omar's love story with the neighbor's daughter, and he fa who he falls in love with in Kabul. And it turns out that she's not only the neighbor's daughter, she's the landlord's daughter. So he's trying to win the hand of a much wealthier uh, daughter from a much wealthier family. And she's Shia, he's Sunni. So it's a bit of a Romeo and Juliet story. And he ultimately decides that he has to leave Kabul to have a chance of coming back and winning her hand. So that's the kind of quest at the heart of it. And he's driving around Kabul listening, as you said, to songs on the radio that are pop songs, Ahmed Zayer, but they're also, the lyrics um, are from poems from the great classical mystic poets like um, Rumi or Hafez of Shiraz. And these lyrics are about life itself is a form of exile and our quest to find our beloved and that it's in sort of romantic language but the beloved for the sufis is of course god and and that's i think something that the book explores is the different kinds of uh, quests that we have this search for this longing for unity that we have this longing for reunion that we have and the different ways this concept of the beloved uh, can be thought of whether it's just in terms of Omar and Layla and a romantic beloved or God and a kind of mystical union. Or later on, um, we talk about with the uh, poet uh, Faiz, um, Mohammed Faiz, uh, the 
beloved becomes a stand-in for the revolution, for, for a, a more just and equal world that perhaps our rational faith no longer allows us to believe to be imminent, but nevertheless we must pursue with the faith that's animated by a kind of love. And that's, that's the kind of politics that we were surrounded uh, by in the, the squat where we ended up in Athens that was run by radical no-borders activists. So there's, yes, love is certainly present throughout the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Afghanistan also was, a, once upon a time, you can say, was a tourist destination. People loved to go there. It was on the hippie trail towards India. Uh, nature's great. Um, mountains are great. Uh, so there is something there. It's not completely lost, or is it, Taki? Uh, not much remaining, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think um, you, you, you saw what uh, happened to the um, statue of Buddha in Bamiyan. Mm -hmm. they just, mm -hmm. The Taliban destroyed it. And I think so many of these uh, sites were destroyed by floods or, uh, you know, due to lack of maintenance and stuff. So, yeah, they're being destroyed and no one is talking about this thing, yeah. At the same time, though, I would say there are still you know, Buddhist monuments in, in Afghanistan. There are still gardens, there are still trees, there are still plants and animals and human beings. And Afghanistan isn't over and it's not finished. And the story for people there, the m millions of people who can't be evacuated to the West goes on. And I think it's important that we keep thinking about Afghanistan as a place where the people have a real struggle, where they find beauty, where they're, they're, they are grappling with a brutal regime, but it's not, uh, it's not this land that's beyond reach. I was there myself in May, and, and so far the Taliban are allowing foreigners to travel there. There's a lot of uh, foreign men and women who are working there with Afghan partners trying to, to do what they can. So it's not, it hasn't been destroyed or, or, or lost. Um, I, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, and uh, we have a couple of minutes left. I would like, love to ask the audience if they have questions, because this is a unique opportunity. Uh, you have a world-class journalist and one of the a great uh, Afghan writers, so I, I really want to invite you to ask questions. Uh, please allow me to start just in the front and then go back. I think we'll manage it. We have like five questions, please. There's a mic. Uh, Thanks. Uh, my question is for Matthew. I, I had the chance to read your book a few weeks ago, and yeah, I'm a big fan because I think, um, yeah, as a work, as a journalistic work, it's um, it's really valuable. But at the same time, uh, I found it very gripping and also very moving. Uh, and I actually had a question running through my head while I read it, uh, and I'm glad I have the chance to ask you. So, um, it's a really risky um, endeavor project that you undertook um, with, you know, risk your life on a daily basis, pretty much. Um, what convinced you to take this decision and also um, how did your friends and family react because uh, you were basically underground, um, undocumented, you burnt your passport and anything could have happened um, at any moment, so how did they react? Well, yes, I mean it's a decision that you take not just for yourself but for your friends and family. It's, just, it's a selfish decision in some ways for them to have to wait knowing they could lose me and I'm lucky to have had their support over all these years. In, in terms of the danger of the trip itself, uh, you know, I, it, was, it was dangerous and scary at times, but I've worked in Afghanistan and Syria and Yemen and a lot of other conflicts and faced situations in the front line that were much more scary and dangerous. And I say that because that's why people, Afghans, Syrians, others are willing to risk their lives on this, on this trip because the conditions they face in their own countries are far more dangerous. And thank you for your nice words. Yeah. So I want to <clears throat> ask you how, how long did you take, or did it take you to recover after this trip? Because I think it was a very special trip. And to both of you, do you think it's only the Taliban? So I met there many very conservative people in Afghanistan. And a young friend of mine, she said, you think it was before the Taliban took over? And she said to me, you won't believe, but it won't be the Taliban who will kill me. It will be my brother, my younger brother, who doesn't know about the world outside. I was very sad about that, but <laughs> so you were there now, so 
What is your experience? Uh, well, I, was, I, I think I was pretty much recovered last June when I went back to Afghanistan, and then the whole country collapsed around me, so I'm kind of back to square one. <laughs> but um, in terms of the Taliban, you know, one, I think one of the misconceptions, and maybe, Taki John, you'll disagree with me, but is that the Taliban are something outside of Afghan society, that the Taliban come from Pakistan or outer space or something like that, and, and we were protecting Af Afghans from the Taliban. But the Taliban represent a tendency within Afghan society. They represent s particular social groups. Um, they also have a lot of external aid from the Pakistani military, but they, um, they are very much one side in a civil war, and there is this war that's happening in every home sometimes between you know, patriarchal uh, gender norms and fundamentalist Islam and, and, and young people who want to move on or change from that or, or, or live differently. But that, unfortunately, as we've learned, is not a, a struggle that you can place, you know, do a lot of good as an outsider. Afghans have to, to figure that out for themselves. Yeah, that's very true. And I, I think there are a lot of um, paradoxes in Afghanistan. And I think uh, it is just, it is not unique for Afghanistan. It's just a part of the uh, paradoxes that you can see in the entire Islamic world. I pretty much agree with the uh, analysis of uh, Hamad Abdus Samad, uh, the Egyptian writer here. Uh, um, um, you know, he says that um, Islam as a, a civil, as a civilization has lost has lost its confidence, and um, compared to West, he um, uh, is ashamed of itself as, as, as somehow, and um, um, because it doesn't have anything um, to say for the current problems. It chooses the um, the violence, and you see a lot of paradoxes. Like you know, the, the Taliban today say that the women cannot go to school. You know, the, the girls cannot go to school from the uh, seventh grade. To, it is not. It is forbidden. Basically, the girls can go to school from until sixth grade, but on the other hand, they say that the Afghan women should go to the female doctors. So, what are these female doctors are going to educate? So it, this is the pure uh, paradox, and there are a lot of paradoxes uh, within the Taliban. And I think it's just a bare and very uh, intensified um, uh, form of the um, paradox or the conflict that you could see the entire world. You know, there are a lot of examples in Iran, in, um, in Arabic countries, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Um, for example, one mullah, returning from Germany, they, they, it, I said it on Facebook, returning from a treatment from Germany, um, on the plane, reading a book about the collapse of um, Western civilization. But you are coming from West from a treatment journey, so. Um, there are a lot of uh, lies that, uh, that the Muslims nowadays tell uh, to themselves, so I think uh, if we look from that perspective, it would be helpful to see. And yes, a lot of Afghans are conservative, uh, and it takes time. But I'll tell you that the Taliban are not the future of Afghanistan. They are in power today, but the young generation, they know that this interpretation of Islam and these uh, conditions are not sustainable. And at some point, it's going to change. And I'm hopeful and optimistic, as you are, Matthew, that it's going to change at some point in the future. Very good. Inshallah. Uh, Inshallah. Da, da, da. Wir haben noch Zeit genug. Also insofern würde ich jetzt tatsächlich vorne bleiben. Dann Sie, genau, und dann gehen wir weiter nach hinten. Uh, gut. Ja, jetzt landet das Mikro bei Ihnen, dann nehmen Sie es ruhig und dann kommt die Dame hier vorne dran. Thanks. Um, Matthew, so firstly, I wanted to thank you for the drive that you have in your work. I think it's quite special. And I think um, for me, it was amazing to read the book because I, I just learned so much about the country that I've never been to um, and about the people, about the love that they share, about, um, I think, the beauty of the culture and the country, uh, which I really appreciated. And I guess um, maybe I had two questions, <laughs> if I may. Um, so one question was during your journey, uh, how did you, you also mentioned this in a couple of um, parts of the book, 
how did you deal with um, sort of not being at the same level as the people that you traveled with? So you were, yes, you burned your passport, but you could always reacquire it, so you were not at the same level. Um, that's not a judgment <laughs> from my side, but that's more so, I think, an ima emotional um, kind of difficulty that I can imagine you went through. And uh, secondly, I, I was wondering, how do you deal with the struggle of kind of bringing across the Afghani point without yourself being an Afghani to the Western audience? So how do you also, um, at least I, I got that from the book, but I don't know if everyone did get it, that Afghanistan is indeed a beautiful country. It's not a dead country. And that's something that we should talk about and recognize in the West. And I'm wondering whether you, you're facing challenges even despite having written the book. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's uh, while I am trying to represent the Afghan perspective, I don't want to try to speak for Afghans. I certainly don't know what it's like to be an Afghan or to be a refugee to not be a privileged Westerner, even if I abandon my passport. But I also think that it's not just a story about Afghans. You know, the reason why I wrote this book is because my country, you know, I'm also an American citizen, my country invaded Afghanistan. And we have, you know, a, a military occupation there. We have a, a, a long history. The world now, there's no separating a place like Afghanistan from the West, from Europe. It's an entangled story. So in a sense, it's, it's my story too. And I think my responsibility to speak about what's happening in these countries to a Western audience. Um, but it is, it is at times difficult, painful even to, to feel so close to someone like my friend Omar, who was really like a brother to me, and also feel this, this unbridgeable gulf. But I think that you have to be, you have to acknowledge that, that you're, that, that there are just so many, there's some hierarchies and divisions in this world between North and South, between wealth and poverty that you can't bridge with good intentions. You can't just wish away or, or, or make it disappear with some act of heroics by being in the same boat as them. Those divisions ex you know, exist in, in, a, in a sense it, it's something that you have to acknowledge, be honest about, um, and try to find a way of being in solidarity despite of it. And, and in that sense, I do think it's a little bit like what I was saying earlier about this Sufi quest for union, you know, the impossibility in this world, in this very divided world of, of, of living, you know, as one humanity, and nevertheless, the everyday struggle for that, that union. And Matthew is kind of Afghan. Uh, it's hardly to recognize that he's not an Afghan, you know, <laughs> the appearance, the accent that he speaks there is unbelievable. And uh, when I search, uh, I googled Matthew, to be honest. And when, when I saw his appearance, I, I thought to myself, he must have done a very good job doing an undercover journey because he's, he's <laughs> totally like an Afghan. Uh, yeah. Uh, here vorne and then da hinten. We have noch, we have noch, this pass noch. Uh, my question has just been put in the. Okay, great. Uh, okay, die Dame and then gehen wir da hinten hin, yeah? Thank you for uh, putting so much effort and put, uh, putting so much emotion and, and to, uh, talking about this heart. Uh, for me, definitely, it's very hard. Uh, but I have a question because we, several times, we were talking about union, that Mathieu were really beautifully uh, talk about it. And also we were talking about so many V's. You know, for example, when also Mathieu were talking about we did this, we did that. I haven't done that. I'm also Afghan. I haven't done that. And, and the, when, the, when Taki Jan was talking about uh, we, we were talking about different we. And that different, I would like to, and also when the, I forgot the name of the panelist, uh, when they were talking about we, it is a different we. And I would like that a little bit we talk about this. If you have any idea about how we allow ourselves to t tell we. Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to speak about we. Um, yeah, the, the, the problem with Afghanistan is that that's true. Uh, I totally understand your point because th there is no uh, statistics, there is no referendum mm, sort of um, say, th there is no uh, 
clear elections in Afghanistan. So we don't, we we really don't know what are the um, the opinion of the people about certain things. So yeah, and you always see that the people of Afghanistan are absent. The United States uh, uh, signs a treaty with with Taliban in Doha without uh, uh, Afghan people being present. You know, the Af even the Afghan government was not part of it. And uh, the decisions for Afghans have always been um, concluded, you know, in, in secret meetings. And uh, yeah, I totally understand your point. We, there is no we, and the we, I mean, the, the people of Afghanistan, we say, you know, a lot of politicians say, you know, even in West, they say that th th these Taliban are different. You know, we, we, we used to say that, no, these Taliban are not different, but uh, every time you could hear something different, no, the, the Afghan people support the Taliban, they are the Taliban, and, or, you know, they are against the Taliban, but there, there were no statistics after 20 years of the presence of the NATO and billions of dollars. There is no exact numbers about about the basic things. For example, we don't know uh, how many people live in Afghanistan. The, the, the number, the exact number of the Afghan population is not known until today. And it's, uh, yeah. I don't know. I think the we, uh, this is a deep discussion. We can spend an hour with that. But the, the we is not... Uh, a wholesale identification with everybody, but it's also the contrary of a disclaimer. So I, if I say we, I adopt a certain um, measure of responsibility, you know, and I think this is part of part of the game because we are all we are always part of what is happening. But of course, we can talk hours about that. There were other questions, one and then there, and we'll make it. Yes, we'll have two other questions. Actually, I. I I would like to disagree to what you just said because we are exactly in the situation that we are self-referential when we look at what went wrong with the interventions. And I, I thank you for your words, Matthew, because I think one has to be very outspoken about what damage was, was inflicted and who did what. And, and therefore, I, 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 I agree, we have to clarify. But I wanted to refer more positively to what, what you did, Taki, which, which I thought was very courageous to say, I worked with GIZ, or Development Community, and I'm actually working with Development Community myself. And look at what funny and stupid ideas came into that work and so on. So here again, we're sitting in Germany looking at the big question. Parliament is looking at it, politicians, parties, everybody, civil society, even the ones who read book. So what went wrong? And, but we're not talking to each other. You know, your mindset, you, you mentioned mindsets that were so different. And then why did people applaud to the stupid development approaches with, which were not fit? I mean, the same counts for security policy. But there's one thing that also struck me in the beginning when you said, here I am, 30-something, sorry, <laughs> 36 you are now, uh, and maybe I have to start again. You know, start my life somewhere again. Again, and that's something we have to discuss right now because the, clo the, the, the doors are closing for, for the appeal 30,000 Afghans on the day that Kabul collapsed were living in Germany. And many came on similar journeys as, as Matthew uh, describes in the book under very, very dangerous conditions before. So what, what's the future for you? And the German government could very easily say, I think very easily say, um, let's grant them a future uh, by regularizing Afghan people in Germany now. So, so what do you have in response to the two points? Um, I, 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 should, I, I suppose I should answer very honestly, right? The honest answer is that the, the current situation is a, um, the system is uh, well established in a very one way form that I don't see any possibility to, to change it. I only said that, that, that uh, you know, um, this way will continue. Because if these projects in Afghanistan didn't work, there should be an, a clear evaluation. But there is an evaluation, not a deep one, but the very same people who 
accomplished this project, who conducted this project, are assigned now to evaluate their projects, which are like their babies. And they said, obviously, at the end of the day, they would say, yeah, these projects were perfect. We did a great job, and you know, and then the, 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 uh, the, the game starts, you know, the blame game. So I don't see any uh, uh, strong intention to change things, and it, it takes a lot of courage to accept that what we have done in Afghanistan, what international community and Afghans together, but more international community, because the international community had the money, and they were in the managerial positions, and they established the system. And we, I myself were, was a very small part of the system. When I indicated to the um, fellows in some certain projects, they told me, do your job, Taki, just leave it. Because we, we had a project running, we had indicators, and these indicators had to be met in order to get more money at the end of the year. So we had always more money to spend and we had to run. And uh, we didn't have any time to think about what's happening. And there's one e famous example that I told Stefan and so many of my friends that, for example, we built in Afghanistan with uh, Germans' money um, libraries, but then we didn't have any books for these libraries. And I, and, um, I was translating uh, a, a press release for one of these libraries that, were, that was built in uh, Baghlan, in north of Afghanistan. And uh, I told them, we build libraries, but we don't have books for them. And, and uh, my manager told me, because we are development organizations, we, are, we just do the infrastructure and capacity development. The culture is the foreign office, which is represented by the um, German embassy. And they were not really, of course, well connected. And at the end of the day, they gave money to the library manager, who was, uh, a, of course, a mullah, because in the provinces, you have a lot of conservative Muslims. And he spent this money buying super dangerous Islamic books to fill the German built library. So yeah, and, and we, really, we post this press release with the library, German, Germ, you know, Germany built this library, but a lot of uh, Islamic Can books. I just say, in, in some cases, I do think the system can change. We saw that with refugees. We were told that Europe was full. We can't allow any more Afghans or Syrians in. We're going to make deals with dictators to keep them out, to build walls. And then the Ukraine war happened, and all of a sudden, there's space for millions of Ukrainians, which is good. Good. We should have brought them in. But what about Afghans who are, you know, have, who are not able to come because of visas, not because of the Taliban? But I think it's much easier maybe to feel sympathy for people when we're not responsible for their plight. And of course, we're much more responsible for the tragedy Afghanistan's facing than that of Ukrainians. But it's great that we welcome them. The Should last we... question. May, short, please. We have to clear the stage, but you have the word. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to both of you for taking time uh, to talk about Afghanistan and also to Matthew for sharing a factful perspective about Afghanistan. Um, so I have two questions. I'm an activist here now in Germany because I also came last year after the fall of Afghanistan. And I have been asked this question like many times in the events or in the gatherings that I go, uh, that what does the future of Afghanistan look like to you. So I'd like to hear this from you both, uh, Matif, as a foreign author who has visited Afghanistan under the uh, Taliban regime, and to Taqi, who has been there and experienced life there. And then uh, a lot of people are uh, really enthusiastic in you know, doing something for Afghanistan from here, but they got no idea like how to help the situation in Afghanistan or what to do for the people there. What would you suggest or recommend people from here, whether it's German or anyone, uh, how, what would you suggest for them to, like in, one ways they can, in what ways they can help Afghanistan? 
Well, I think I'll let Taki answer that that second question since he's an Afghan here. Um, but I, um, it's, and it's difficult to answer the question about the future of Afghanistan in the short time we have left. But I'm just going to say that uh, the crisis is ongoing. You know, there's millions of Afghans who don't have enough food. Uh, there's a real concern that with the rise in food prices because of the Ukraine war, there's going to be a malnutrition crisis. People are going to starve. So it's essential that we keep pressure on our governments to um, to provide funding, but also to engage with the Taliban. They're the government now, and to punish the Taliban would um, be out of spite would just be punishing the people of Afghanistan collectively if we if we blockade them with sanctions. Um, to be honest, I, I, I think uh, we are going through another circle of history. We are going to, you know, dark, deep, day, deep dark days, and then uh, at some point we, we are going to have more um, uh, light, and then uh, we are going to back to dark. I don't know. But I'm pessimistic nowadays. I think um, the Taliban, the way they are um, imposing the Sharia, on the daily life of people is something that eventually make people uh, dislike uh, the religion and it's something good. They start keeping distance they, they, because they, they, they realize that their fantasies about their religion practically is something horrible. And uh, maybe they start thinking after 40 years of jihad that maybe, yeah, it was not a good idea after all. And, uh, you know, the young generation keep uh, more and more distance and then um, try to find some sort of um, new way, like a um, new form of government, like, I don't know, uh, a, 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 government, a, a government without being Islamic. Uh, maybe this is going to be the way that Afghanistan at some point uh, will hit to. Um, but let's see. But I think the Taliban with this uh, very, um, very hard Sharia laws will push people thinking into that direction. Uh, that's the perspective, at least. Thank you, Taki. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you all. Um, thank you very much. The authors will be at the bookstore. Uh, in the front of the building to sign books or talk to you, if you like. We have to clear the stage. Thank you very much.